Hey everybody, welcome to K Rock. How are you doing? I'm Stryker, and I thought it would be a perfect day to talk to Jared and Duddy from Dirty Heads. <laughs> Guys, so here's the deal. I have been following your career since day one. I heard the first song that was ever on the radio. Maybe I even played it. I met you guys before you were famous. All this time has gone by, and I forgot how the hell it even happened. So I'm here just to ask you a bunch of questions, and if you're cool, can you, we just roll through a bunch of stuff? Yeah, of course. Perfect. All right, um, but I want to start off with the album Swim Team, which is your most recent album. You guys yeah. know Swim Team, right? <laughs> There's a song with Kyle from the Unlikely Candidates called Celebrate. Yeah. And I think whether you're a musician or a comedian, an actor, or maybe even someone in the military, or no matter what you do, that song really pulls at the heartstrings. How did that song come together, Jared? We heard, we were working with a production duo, Heavy, and they had that hook. And they were just showing us what we did, or what, what they had been doing right, right then. Like, we're working on this, we're working on this. We have this start, and we just want to show you guys. And it was that hook with Kyle. And we were like, dude, that, like, it hit us like a truck. Like, all the lyrics resonated with us since we're in a touring, at, like, band. We've been touring since day one, like, 12 years ago so it like automatically hit us in the feels you know we were like oh my god I can I already know my verse like I already know what I'm gonna talk about I was like let, let us flip this like in a dirty heads world like can we have this this hook and we'll make it our own and they were like yeah of course and we got Kyle in and we met him and everything gelled really well and we wanted to do you know we we had songs about being gone and missing home and things but we really wanted to do like a realistic take on being a traveling, touring musician, or just somebody that that is gone a lot for work or military, whatever you're saying, it's just just a realistic take on that and the things that you have to sacrifice that you don't realize, even small little things are so important and that you ha kind of give up. And it's, when you say them like, oh, birthdays and vacations and things like that, they don't seem that important. But after you've missed, you know, your whole family's birthdays, you know, five years in a row or you've missed three Christmases in a row, um, you start realizing how important family is. And you start realizing that that your music has become bigger than you. So you're torn because you don't want to let your fans down and you don't want to not be out on the road. At the same time, you want to balance your personal life at home. And we were such, like, we knew that touring was what we needed to do. So we wanted to hit it so hard, and we really, really did. But you get to a certain point where you're just like, I don't know how to, like, how do we juggle these two things with, like, making my friends and family happy at home with making the fans happy at the same time? Like, it's a really weird line that you have to walk, you know? And the one thing that I think is so great in the song, Duddy, you say, look, we're missing all this stuff, but it's not that I'm a spoiled rock star. I appreciate what's going on in, in our lives here. No, definitely, you know, and that's what it's about. Like, we don't want people to hear that song and think it's us, like, complaining, like, you don't know how it is. Like, we have to, it's not that at all. It's, like, actually saying, like, how much we appreciate what we get to do. We're doing this because we love it. And if we didn't appreciate it and respect what we actually have and, and just, we're living our dreams. We really are. So in all of that fact, we appreciate it, but there still is real life going on behind the scenes of we are, we are, we're just real people, just like you with normal families, up, good days, bad days, all that, you know? So, you know, there's ups and downs. Yeah, I, I think to become successful at what you're doing, you have to sacrifice things. I think that's what we wanted to also get across is that you're going to have to sacrifice. Like, you're going to have to work. Work harder than everybody else. You know, pay those dues. Sacrifice those things. It's those, the people that don't want to do that. Are, you know, they're not going to get to where they want to be. And that's 100%. And I've worked here at K-Rock for many years and been in radio for many years. And for a while, I didn't appreciate how much uh, work a band puts in. Because, yes, the show starts at 9 p.m. and you play for an hour and 25 minutes. But at 8 a.m., you're talking to a dorky radio nerd like me on the radio. <laughs> and then you got to do a phone interview with the guy in Tuscaloosa who's on the radio there. And then you have to do a photo shoot. And you are on, on like, you want to look good in the, you don't want to look like you just rolled out of bed. Yeah. And then finally, after 10 hours, <laughs> you're playing this stupid show. Yeah, it's a, it's a right. lot of hurry up and wait. And it's not, like, physically demanding, I don't think. Right. Um, 
uh, it's it's you do have to be on, you know. It's more like socially, you c- it can be draining. But like, I used to dig ditches for sprinkler systems, you know. Like, so this shit is easy to me. I'm right. like, fine. <laughs> you want me to do an it? And I got to do an interview, and then I got a sound check, and then I got to play an hour and a half. Like, whatever, that's fine with me. You know, I used to do grunt work, so it's like. I look back at things like that. I think it's all perspective. It's all perspective. And I think people lose perspective when they're like, I'm in a band and I have to do all these interviews and I have to go on tour for a month. You got to go on tour for a month with your friends. If you do it right, you have to go on tour for a month with your friends in the summertime and play all these <laughs> rad shows. Oh, boo hoo. You know, and then you go home and you have a month off. You know, it's just like, I think it's all perspective. Let's talk about how everything got started. So you talked about the grunt work, Jared, before Dirty Heads. Uh, Duddy, what jobs did you have before becoming a professional musician? Uh, I was a, a waiter for many years. Right. And I followed I, him around restaurant to restaurant yeah, as a I host. Would bring him, Can you hire my buddy? Can you hire my buddy? <laughs> you would get a job and then they'd be like, you gotta hire this dude. He's a nice guy. Worthless. Um, I stopped doing the waiter job though when I found myself doing the high voice. Like, oh yeah, no, let me get you that. The like mom telephone voice? You know when I get there and I, I know that you've only been here for like three minutes. And I get, we've been here for ten minutes. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm, a, I, I, I'm an idiot, you're right. And then I was like, oh my God, I can't do that anymore. And then I went and I worked for school districts. I, I helped like uh, you know, autistic kids in classes and things like that. And then I was doing that before the, once the band started. You can clap for that. That's like, <laughs> it's good that you did that before all the sinning that you did that came afterwards. 2008, if I'm correct, any port in a storm came out. But the years leading up to that, what the hell were you two doing to figure out uh, musically how you were going to make it work? You know, uh, I think it was one of those things for us, and we always talk about it. Um, We didn't exactly have a plan of how it was going to work, but we just always knew it was going to work. Just that feeling inside of like people like, well, it's hard to make it in a band, and you know, what if it doesn't work out? And it's just like, well, it is gonna work out, and that's that was kind of been our mentality ever since. And um, you know, we've we've been positive, we've we've stuck to like our plan of just being positive, working hard, doing whatever it takes, and that's just kind of how we've ran our careers, and it's led us here. I, I remember when we first met and we started writing music, and when we decided like okay, we, w- we, we want to be in a band. Like, we want to do this. Like, this is what we're going to put all our eggs in one basket. We're going to do this. And I remember thinking every single night about it. I would think about it before I went to bed. Every single night. And I never once felt like it wasn't going to happen. You know, I, like, just had this feeling in my gut. And then I started thinking about it all day. And it just always felt right. You know, and I like, there's an argument against, you know, okay, saying that you can just manifest things by thinking about them a lot, thinking about them and wanting them and wanting them and putting it out in the universe. I guess there is an argument against that, but that's how it felt. Like, I I just knew. Like, I would talk to my mom and she'd be like, are you sure you want to do this? You know, like, uh, you you might want to have like a backup plan. I was like, no. I'm good, like, this is it, this is gonna happen. They were just like, oh, uh, you know, my dad, you know, it's really hard to make it in the music industry. It's like one in a million, I was like, no, we're good. And like it just, I knew it. And I, and I think maybe that putting our, all our eggs in one basket, maybe that helped, <laughs> I think. Like we had no backup plans. I mean, it sounds smart to have a backup plan, but maybe that's why we worked so hard or maybe not having a safety net pushed us more than other people. I don't know. But just think, I mean, if one wants to become a doctor or a lawyer, how many years you have to put in for that? And that is you are so focused. It's very similar from my experience watching bands. Like you, it's like becoming a doctor or a lawyer. It takes so many years to find It's exactly like becoming a doctor, Stryker. (laughs) That's what I, I'm always just like, man, being in a band is exactly like a doctor. He's delivered nine babies, by the way. (laughs) I have actually on the road. I might have, oh, I was. I remember specifically going to metal school on Sunset Boulevard. Oh, yeah. Do you remember that? Yeah. We, we, I met you before like we were anything. I was striker player, music, please. And you're like, get no. out of here. <laughs> nope. No, I'm just kidding. We, I met you with uh, Vince Sevenfold. The Vince yes. Sevenfold guys took us to metal school, and uh, we went and saw Brian's dad play like amazing guitar earlier in Huntington, and then we went up to metal school, and I met you for the first time. That was funny. And Jimmy played drums. Jimmy rest went up there, the Rev, rest in peace, went up there and played drums. Metal school guys called him And they him kept playing play. off time to fuck him up. <laughs> it was hilarious. It was so good. And I, and I remember talking to you. We were outside of the venue, and you're like, yeah, dirty heads. And then it was not long after 
that you guys were being played on K-Rock. And I think I remember the story on how you guys got into our world. Can you kind of just set it up and let's go from there? Yeah, I love this story. Uh, so, because nobody's going to believe it half the time. So our manager brings in music for K-Rock to like see if there's any singles he wants to see. Hey, is there any music that you guys will play? And he plays them like four songs. And they're like, no. And it was a CD that, that his assistant had burned him. And it was four songs from Any Port in a, song, uh, any port in a Storm. And they play the four songs, and they weren't feeling any of it. And then all of a sudden, a fifth song starts playing. And it wasn't supposed to be on the CD. It was Lay Me Down, a demo of Lay Me Down that she just accidentally dragged onto the CD. And it hadn't been mixed, mastered, anything. It was like the most rough version of Lay Me Down ever. And they were like, we love it. I want to play it right now. And it's just like, and our manager was like, no, 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 we gotta like mix this and master. He's like, no, this is great. Boom, goes on the radio like seven, 11 weeks later, it's still number one. Like it broke a bunch of records, all this stuff. We're like, what? Like it just goes to show you with the state of music right now, with technology, you could be a, you could be dog shit in the studio, right? <laughs> And we could probably get it sound pretty good with uh, like a lot of the plugins out there. Like we could get it decent. So it just goes to show that that everything doesn't have to be perfect. You don't have to go in, melodyne everything, like play your parts over. I'm not saying put out like half-ass music, but as long as there's feeling there, like this song just felt right. And it was a demo. And sometimes like in this world, sometimes we get in our own way and we're like, the demo works. There's ma if there's magic to something in, in music, if it feels right, don't mess with it. Like, don't polish it too much. Don't try and make it perfect because that's how you're supposed to write music, you know? And the song wasn't just number one here in Southern California because you guys are from here. It was number one in Des Moines. It was number one in New York. It was in Australia. It was just blowing up. Duddy, what do you remember about the trajectory of the band uh, one month you're here, and then eight months later it was something else. What was it like? I mean, it was a big change for us pretty quick that we noticed. Um, I guess, like, there was that movie, um, that thing you do. There was that scene where they start to finally hear the song on the radio. Tom Hanks movie? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's the best. Deep, and, you know, they all start, they're showing their, their, when the, that day they all hear their song for the first time on the radio, and they're all kind of freaking out. It was kind of that vibe for, like, a couple weeks around town. I'd get in my car and the song would be playing, or I'd see my friends and they'd be like, oh my God, I hear your song every day. And, you know, going from that garage band of like, oh, are we going to do this? And everyone kind of being like, you guys are getting old, what are you doing? To like, wow, you guys are doing it. It was a, you know, it was a, it was a very good feeling. And, you know, we're still here doing it. And did you say to your mom and your dad who were like, do you sure you want to like, F you, turn on the radio, we're on every seven minutes. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I mean, it was, it was kind of terrifying for me. You know, it was just like, if, is this it? Like, you know, our shows went from like 50 people to like 500 people, you know, and we just kept touring off of that. So it was like our first break of many little breaks, you know, and I think that's what we wanted. Or no, that, that is actually, that's not what we wanted. I think that's what we needed and we always wanted to, longevity was like our main thing. We want to be around, you know, when we're 50 and 60 and playing music and things like that. And I think to have a career like that, you need it needs to be a bunch of little breaks rather, you know, when you're 21, you want everything. And I want to blow up right now. I want to blow up right now. I want to be the biggest band in the world right now. Why can't we have it right now? Well, just because you want it doesn't mean that that's right for you. And looking back on it, I'm so glad because maybe you're not ready at that time. You know, you need to be prepared for when you get lucky. Like I think to be successful, you need to be, have, you need to be prepared, you need to be lucky, and you need to be persistent, you know, so you just always go, 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 and if you, you keep hitting it, you keep hitting it, you're eventually going to get lucky, but you need to be prepared for it. I think maybe back in the day, we might not have been, or we might not have been ready for these things, so I'd rather have a really long career with little breaks throughout the whole thing than one big one, and so right. when Lay Me Down hit, I was just like, terrified, like, is this it? Like, no, we just got to head down, don't worry about it, keep going, so anytime something good happens, like, that's rad, I'm really stoked that this is happening, really, really Glad, really proud, really stoked on everybody, but like, let's just keep our heads down and keep going, you know? And fortunately, so many people were introduced to Dirty Heads at that time that they got to go hear songs like Stand Tall yeah. and go back and listen to the songs that you had already created, and people could be like, wow, these guys are really, really good. Um, what about carrots that were kind of dangled in front of you that you thought, oh my God, this is gonna happen, and they don't? Because I recall. <laughs> 
there was some great label stuff happening, and then oh, all yeah. of a sudden they're like, ah, this big label or big label is not really going to happen. There were so many carrots yeah. that we didn't get. Well, we got, right when we kind of started doing stuff is right when like, the music industry started really taking a dive. Napster. And it kind of was like, so, Remember now, that's how long ago. <laughs> you know, record labels and bands and radio and everything was kind of starting to scramble for a second, like right when we started in the business so it, it was a weird time and you know we got this great offer from Warner Brothers and it was like oh my god we're gonna be on a major record label we're rock stars we're gonna right? buy golden Lamborghinis Where's, yeah and... I should have the money in the mail by tomorrow yeah you like know? You... <laughs> but and you know we recorded a whole album and you know uh, months and months and months later just got dropped and the album really never went out with them you know and and that was just kind of one of those I think it was a good thing, and it made us realize, hey, like it's not going to just happen like that overnight. You still got to work hard. You still got to keep your head down because this might happen a lot more times. But you just got to stay positive. If this is really what you want to do, then you got to you got to do it. You know? Um, did you feel dejection or rejection when you were in your own private space? Even though you got you kept you know you talk about how hard you're going to work, we're going to. But at night by yourself, were you ever like, God? Damn Honestly, it. you know, it was funny when we got. When we got like officially, okay, they're not going to release this album, we had been already kind of in our heads of like, well, we need to get this out. So it was almost like a relief, like, okay, cool. And they were actually really nice about it. They gave us the album back. They're like, you know what? You can just have it, do whatever you guys want with it. We don't want to hold you guys up anymore, so go ahead. So we recorded this great album, and we, now we have it. And now instead of waiting around for them, now we can go, you know, we can go work hard and make our own future for ourselves without having to wait on somebody else. And uh, I think, it, you know, it kind of was a relief and more of a blessing of anything. Yeah, because it, it, it wasn't like they dropped us overnight. Like, they sat on the album for a while. So I think we had got done with the album, and it was like two or three years of just like... What are we doing? What are you guys going to do? Like, we're, we're touring off of this, and you guys aren't releasing it. So I think when we did get dropped, it was like, all right, cool. We, we can have it. It's ours now. We'll just find an independent label, and then we'll go out and put it on that. And then we did that, and then that label completely robbed us of like everything. They were like this shysty back alley label. I don't give a shit if the guy's out there fucking sorry, I'm cussing so much That's I told you right. I wouldn't we're like fine. You can cuss just on this. like whatever, the guy's kook, I'm not even gonna say it. But we got burned again on this independent label that tried to sell the they tried to sell their label because they had a number one song band on their label. So they tried to use us to sell their label and then the guy like took all everybody's money and then ran and we couldn't find them. So we were like okay, like, there's another, like, there's another thing. So it was like, but it wasn't a bummer. It was always just like, all right, why does everybody keep dicking around? Like, just get, let's just do it ourselves. I think it was good that it happened this way because every time that happened, it would make us so frustrated because it was like, let's just do it ourselves. Because all these guys keep just, you're just ruining it and then you're taking this and everybody's dicking us around. We just want to put out music and we just want to play shows. Like, why can't we just find a home that'll let us do that? You know, and like, it just gave us more fight, like more fuel to go out and do it independently and just realizing that you can't rely on your label. You cannot rely on your label. You can't rely on your radio guys. You can't rely on anybody. You have to go out there and put in the groundwork. And it really for the way that it happened for us, it really comes down to our fans and making that connection with our fans at the live show and touring from day one. There's, no, there's nothing is ever going to replace live music. Right. Music industry is going to change. The way people listen to music is, is, is going to change. The way people purchase music is going to change. But live shows, until we start doing crazy virtual reality stuff, are always going to be there, you know? And that's one of the things I've said to you off camera and on radio how much Can't I wait love your live you. shows. What's oh, that? Oh, never mind. What's that? <laughs> How much I love your live shows Thank from you, the brother. second I saw you. Your two voices that mesh together. Maybe on paper, you'd be like, yeah, I don't know, like Be Real and Send Dog from Cypress City. You're like, I don't know. But when on record, it's like, holy cow, this is so good. Thanks, That's like you guys. And your band is so good. And the, the, the musicianship and the writing and the production. And one gentleman that you've worked with who is not here today, and I don't know how in the world you met him, is Rome Ramirez. Rome. Oh, yeah. 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 How, how did he get involved with you he guys? He was sleeping in his van <laughs> outside of our studio for, no, like, no a year. No, no joke. joke. Had, like, was just working odd jobs and, like, moved down from Oakland and, like, wanted to get into music and was just like, I'm just going to sleep in front of the studio and, like, sweep in the studio and just try and meet as many people as I can. And he was like... 
you know, close to our age and super cool. And we got along. We were friends. We were like, this kid is really, really good. And he was just really talented. And that was before any of the Sublime with Rome stuff happened. We wrote Lay Me Down. And once we wrote Lay Me Down, that came out. That was right when the Sublime was, with Rome stuff was happening. But before that, it was just like he was just our friend that we knew. And it's really cool to be able to come up with one of your closest friends. And, like, musically, he's just been there with us. And he really gets the dirty heads. And he's become a great producer, a great songwriter. And we work... We worked a lot with him almost on every album with it for a couple songs because he's just super fun to hang out with. And we have a good time. It's yeah. natural. It's and, natural. And, yeah, and some of the best songs that we've written, you know, have been either his production or been at his house or something like that. So we vibe really well with him. And, uh, you know, when, when you have magic like that, you're going to keep it going, but not too much. We try and go out of the box and work with other people as much as we can. So the magic happened, and then it's time to make uh, Cabin by the Sea, which is album number two. And we all know how your brains work and how hard workers you are, but did you feel any pressure at all going to make a new album? Like, wow, now we got to be on the radio again with this. We know what it takes. Or what was your, do you, do you recall what your thoughts were then? I mean, I definitely think there was a, a different level of like, okay, n now we are on this level. We can't just, we got to put out, we got to continue to put out good music. We can't just go, let's not, let's not just think that Lay Me Down is going to be, it's number one, that's the best, like, that's just where it's going to be. Like, we want to now top that and continue to top it. And not just with writing the music, with our live show, with everything in our career, it's like, we always have a level we want to get to. And once we get there, we're like, sweet, now we got to get here. Now we got to get here. So I think it just inspired us to keep working hard and um, keeping the same attitude, really. Yeah, like I was saying earlier, like, I don't think we put too much weight on it because if you do, then it's going to screw you up in the studio. You're going to be like, well, we have to do a song that's as good as Lay Me Down. Lay Me Down was a demo that we never thought would see the light of day. Like, if you would have told me to pick a single back then, I would have never picked Lay Me Down because it was just some demo. So we knew we don't know. We don't know what songs are going to catch. So if you worry about that too much, that's going to get in the way. So we just wanted to go in the studio and, and do something with Cabin by the Sea. We, we wanted to do something a little bit more like organic. Like We did a lot of mushrooms when we were writing that album. <laughs> 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 that makes sense. <laughs> Spread Too Thin was on that album. Yeah. And I don't want to say it's a full theme of everything, but to do what you guys do, you are always spread very thin. It's like you get six hours of sleep, then you got to do this, but then you got to be on point on this. And that particular track, Duddy, do you remember how that one came together? Because I played the hell out of that on the radio, and I still love yeah, that Yeah, I do. Jared, Jared came with that idea, and he came to me, and he's like, man, I, I got this... This cool thing my dad said to me the other day is I, I said, Dad, I feel like I'm just like spread too thin. He's like, yeah, you're like a piece of bread with not enough butter. And I was like, what? He's like, yeah, you're spread too thin. And then he had that, or, uh, you know, he had the, the melody for it. And, uh, and I was like, that's genius. Were you going to start singing I vacation? Was sing They're vacation. a little similar. I just thought, I was. I was like, oh, shit. And Can then I, I realized, the shit, I don't even know how spread too thin goes anymore. So I just continued with the conversation. Am I just regurgitating the same song yes. over and over? Uh, yeah, so I don't know. Maybe Jared wants to go into a little bit more on that one because that was that was definitely came from his idea. I, I think it was like we were kind of that was at the time where we were getting fed up with like the music industry and what we were going through, you know, and and between that and touring and like, you know, wanting so much, you know, it, that that like going back to what I was saying, like I wanted this, I wanted this, I wanted this, but it wasn't supposed to happen. I'm like I, I look back on it now and I'm so glad the way everything happened. I wish I would have known now because I would have just chilled out. Um, but I think I was just frustrated and yeah, my dad said that and I was like oh that's a good saying and I always try and find little sayings and put them in my phone for for song starts or lyrics or anything like that and, um, and how do you put them in do you sing them in or do you type in phrases I, I sometimes I type them in if I don't have melodies but I usually sing them into my memo my voice memo you know but and I swear to god before I got married my wife she was so nice I can't believe she didn't say anything but she thought I was cheating on her for like the longest time she said like 6 months she thought I was cheating on her cuz at like 2 in the morning right before I go to sleep I always get song ideas like I always get melodies and things like that and I've too many times been like oh that's a really cool melody all right go to sleep wake up Oh, I can't remember it. So I would get out of bed at like 2 in the morning, and I would go in the other room, but I'd grab my phone. So I'd grab my phone, and I'd go in the other room, and then she'd hear me whispering. <laughs> so she thought I was cheating on her. And I was like, how long did you think that I was? She's like, I didn't know, but I like had suspicions. It's been like a good six months. And she's like, what are you doing? I was like, I'm, I'm just recording little voice memos. And I had to like go back, and I showed her, and they're like terrible because I'm just like whispering these little voice memos on my phone. 
Does your wife have your passcode to your Instagram? Oh, yeah, she can do whatever. Okay. Yeah, she runs my Instagram. <laughs> no, <I'm just> <laughs> she never writes back. I feel oh, like no, she has, oh, Sorry, dude. <laughs> Um, this is a, I know, probably a stereotypical question, but I am sincere with it. How has the songwriting changed here in 2018 for you guys? Do you, are you always in the same room together? Do you text each other? Duddy, how does it go down now? You know, um, I feel like it's very similar to, to how it really began. I mean, it could come from many different ways. It could come from Jared coming, hey, my dad just had this cool saying, you know, you're spread too thin, or a uh, guitar lick I had. Um, it could be I could have a, almost a full track, or we can go in and just have nothing and just start from scratch. It really comes in all different ways. Um, I think that's what really makes it work for us. And we get a lot of different takes on, on songs and, and just a lot of different inspiration. We never have a set like, this is how we're going to write this album. We just get in the studio and we just start going. Um, what is success to you, Jared? Um, I think happiness and perspective is success to me. Um, really, I, I think at the end of the day, like I was saying, it's longevity and it's being able to... I, my, my biggest thing is, is being present. I want to be present in like the now more. And I want to be able to live my personal life and my professional life and be happy in both of them. And I think I'd, we had put so much into our professional life. It was just band, band. That was the most important thing, band. I don't care if it's my you know, best friend's wedding. I, okay, birthdays, whatever. That's not important. Like It's band, 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 band. And I think to have a balance finally, I feel like we're finally getting to the point. And we, wanna, we have so much we want to do still. Like We still feel like we're so small. You know, just, just I, I think having a really good balance and perspective. But like really, I mean, success for me is just like, my dogs and like <laughs> surfing being if I can surf in the morning come home hang out with my dogs my wife in my backyard like that's all I really need you know just being just living slow and happy and being able to play music for the next 30 years Nick Hexum who I talked to recently thinks yeah 311 we may only be 50% done with this thing yeah um so what like and you just said in the answer but like what do you what do you envision in the next 20 years is just let's make an album let's put it out do you like what do you what do you see I mean just like I said just keep our head down and and touring and yeah I think we're just going to keep doing what we're doing because it's working and we're happy still we it, it, we could get be like man I'm burnt on the way we're doing things so let's change it and I think that that's I, I think maybe because we do it kind of differently each album that that's what's keeping us happy and inspired because we're our fans kind of allow us to go these different, go down these different avenues of music because we started with Any Port in a Storm. It was so eclectic that we can go and do more hip hop on one album. And then we can go and do more acoustic, folky stuff on one album. We can go do more alternative on one album. So maybe that's what's keeping us sane. Um, but uh, like Nick was saying, like, I think when you, when you get to a point where you're like, we've made it, that's your death. Right. You know, like, I don't care how. I don't think however big we get, we'll ever be like, okay, we're, we're good now, you know? I don't know. Do you ever feel satisfied, Duddy? From my super small bubble, I'm never satisfied, and I'm always worried, like, you know, thanks for working here. We're going to have to let you go next week. So I'm like, <laughs> always like, what the hell am I going to do? I hope I can do a good job. And I'm like, oh, my God, I think I did good, but how am I going to do better? How does your mind tick? I mean, just like that. I mean, I think everyone probably has those feelings at some point, you know, and definitely uh, coming from a band, too, is it's like, hey, if – Tomorrow, this band just wasn't working out anymore. What are we going to do, you know? Um, but I think that just goes back to, you know, having that passion for it. So regardless, I'm just going to continue to work at it. I love it. There's nothing else I, I could do at this point. This is where my mind's at. This is where my passion's at. And I think just, uh, you know, at the end of every night, if you're laying in bed and you're thinking, like, man, I'm doing the best I can at this. I'm working hard. I still love this. You know, that's all you can really do and just hope for the best. There is a producer out there who is, like in the country world, he's similar to like a Rick Rubin. And a birdie whispered in my ear about this guy named Dave Cobb. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Now, is there a chance that you guys may work with his... I'm not saying you're going to wear sassoons and giant belt buckles. Uh, maybe you are, but could you be working with this gentleman? This I, I hope so. We are in touch with him. And, and yeah, no, it's, 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 we're not going after him because, of, because we want to do a country album, because 
we're not going to do a country album. I can tell you that right now. <laughs> yeah. um, but the way he produces and um, and and it's just it's phenomenal. And like it, he does a lot of the Chris Stapleton stuff. If you don't know, you can look him up. Dave Cobb, Grammy winner, incredible yeah, songwriter, just, performer. The whole he's thing. massive, and it's just he the way he produces live music. I think is what we want Um, because we wanted to do a more like this last album we did. It was more leaning towards hip hop. Like we went in and we had no, we were just like, let's go in and have fun. And a lot of it came out programmed in hip hop. We were in the, we were in the studio making beats and getting samples and sampling ourselves and doing things like that. And we really didn't rely too much on the band on this one, even though we did have them come in and do their parts. I think this next album, we really want to write it as a band and rely really solely on the band and do a live album and the way dave produces with he i feel like what up from what i've listened to if the part isn't if you have to add a bunch of shit to the part it's not a good enough part you know like if there's just drums guitar vocal and bass like dave cobb will get the best drums guitar vocal and bass and that's all you need to worry about and the song will, will come out great and and maybe that's going to push us again. We really like being pushed and learning new things as songwriters. And I think Dave Cobb is somebody that will do all those things. Nice. Yeah. Thanks for opening up so much and chatting with me here. Oh, thank you. Um, congratulations on everything you have done in your career. And as long as you guys keep making your music and playing your shows, I will be there having your back for your entire career. Congratulations on everything. Dirty Heads, everybody. Thank you, guys. Jared and Duddy. <laughs> Swim Team is the latest album. That's been the Hangout Session. I am Stryker at the world-famous K-Rock. See you guys.